This is Dan Schneider on this Dan Schneider video interview. I have another in my series on creativity. Jonathan Gottschall is my guest, and we will be speaking with him in a moment. This is another in my series on creativity, its roots, what it is, and my guest is Jonathan Gottschall. He has written several books that deal with the nature of creativity, as I like to usually do. Turn the floor over to my guests for a few minutes to give a little bit of background on themselves, both personally and on the subject at hand. So welcome, Jonathan. If you could do just that, tell a little bit about who you are, your ideas on creativity, and where you're coming from. Uh, yes. Uh, thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me on. Um, as, I, as you said, my name is Jonathan Gottschall. I live here in Washington, Pennsylvania. I have a PhD in English. I was trained as a literary scholar, um, and coming up through the ranks, um, about, I guess it was close to 20 years ago now, it was sort of in the heyday of postmodernism, post-structuralism, and it was a period uh, when I was in graduate school when the whole humanities were unbelievably cynical about the capacity of humans really to ever figure anything out. And I had gone to graduate school in a fairly uh, high-minded, idealistic way. I was expecting to go there to become a real scholar, to do my tiny part, to produce knowledge that hopefully would be reliable and durable and truer than what came before. And I was just told that that, that really didn't work. And so I started searching around for a way to study humanities, to study literature, uh, forms of artistic creativity in ways that would be, be more durable and more reliable uh, than what had come before. And I quickly came across the model of the sciences, the model of uh, gradually testing and refining our knowledge um, until we come to conclusions that basically everyone agrees are provisionally at least truer than, than what came before. Um, and so I, I, I sort of embarked on an experiment. How far could I get by applying the theories of the sciences, uh, to, by informing my work with data from the sciences, and with uh, sort of ransacking the sciences for methodologies that I could transfer over to uh, the humanities? Could, could, could some questions about literature and art be asked and be addressed in a methodologically scientific way? So I sort of staked out a territory uh, in the borderlands between the sciences and the humanities as a sort of bridge, um, a way to use uh, information from the humanities to inform the sciences and vice versa. And that's still where a lot of my work uh, is is going today. However, I should say that you know that the, the, the whole sort of academic establishment wasn't really all that um, open to what I wanted to do. So I've had uh, some some success, you know, some good publishing success, some some good, I guess you'd call it media success. Um, but I was never really able to find a foothold in humanities uh, departments and English departments. I was seen as sort of a threatening figure. Um, and so I've left uh, the academy, and in the last few years, um, I've been writing different sorts of books. I wrote a book called The Professor in the Cage, Why Men Fight and Why We Like to Watch, which is a book about cage fighting of all things. And I've been trying my uh, hand at my own sort of creativity, trying trying to write some, some novels. And so right now, my head is very much in a, a sort of fantasy land of, of, of the novel that I'm trying to create. So well, I guess, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm, I'm done. I was about to pass it back to you. Okay. Uh, I've done, this is maybe the seventh or eighth creativity show I've done in this series, and I've done all different types of creativity. Uh, the last one, in fact, was on non-human, the cosmic creativity that I spoke of. But let's uh, focus on uh, your book uh, about the storytelling animal, since, uh, uh, as you said, that seems to be the basis of uh, literature, etc. It seems to be uh, more up your alley. Um you mentioned uh, a certain hostility uh, towards you from, I would assume, uh, MFA programs, creative writing programs. Uh, why was it? And I ask this because my website, which has been around for over 15 years now, is generally loathed in the MFA writing establishment because when I look at, when I read people like the Jonathan Franzens or the Richard Russo's or the David Foster Wallace's, I see at best bad soap opera level writing and at worst just indiscriminate jizzing that isn't really uh, 
uh, telling any kind of a story. And I'm not saying stories have to be A to B to C plot driven. Absolutely not. 2001 A Space Odyssey is a great film with a great story that totally dashes that kind of formula. Why were you seen as a threat, uh, uh, do you think, uh, to, I guess you would call the literary or the academic establishment? Can you hold your mic up a little closer? You're Sorry. Yep. It wasn't so much the MFA types in my case. It was very much the the uh, PhDs, the literary theorists, the the literary critics um, who uh, inhabit literature departments, who are entrusted with studying literature. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure this out. Um, why was my work uh, seen as interesting in the, in the sort of general public that you know the book The Storytelling Animal, for instance, sold very well, and it's been a book that has actually sort of been adopted now uh, in many uh, English departments as a sort of entry level uh, uh, text uh, in English departments. But I think you know it, it was, there was multiple issues. Um, uh, the first thing is I think that uh, academic literary studies is. Uh, Really deeply conservative. Uh, the people in those departments are conservatives. Uh, they're they're liberal politically, yeah. but in basic orientation, they are conservatives. Yeah. They really are, are are quite hostile to change, and they are they are threatened by change. And they saw in what I was trying to do, and some of the rhetoric I deployed early in my career, which was sort of unfortunate and a little bit too vigorous, a little bit too aggressive. Really, I, was, I had a sort of angry young man phase where I wanted to sort of abolish uh, how things were done in uh, humanities departments. And I, I, I used a tone that was really harsher than I, than I needed and uh, was really sort of counterproductive. Uh, in, in this book here, as you can see, I noticed it's on, on the wall, the, the one in blue there, uh, high up, that's called Literature, Science, and a New Humanities. And that book starts with an introduction calling for total upheaval mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in the world of uh, Literary studies, and that was that was really a, a more radical position um, than I even felt myself. Uh, there was there was a lot of rhetoric in that, so it was partly my, partly my own fault, and partly just running into um, people that really just weren't and were, were sort of and also were, were, were quite hostile to the sciences. So I came up again in the in the, in the 1990s when I was in graduate school. This is the height of the, of the so-called science wars. Uh, this, uh, you know, this, the Sokol hoax, all of that stuff, when people in the humanities really had had sort of arrayed themselves in sort of militant opposition to what was going on in the sciences. And I was sort of adopting and embracing scientific modes, trying to bring them into the humanities, and they just saw me as a barbarian at the gates. Well, I want to dig into your book, uh, uh, The Storytelling Animal, uh, first from a, a sort of biological evolutionary uh, uh, perspective. Uh, but before I do that, I just want to uh, touch on one other thing uh, regarding uh, the current state of sort of writing programs and creative writing programs. And I have a popular website. Just this morning, I had gotten an email from a fellow who says he's a 24-year-old black male who's, who's hesitant to go into writing programs because uh, he feels that he's going to be homogenized. And that's one of the great things that I've seen uh, with uh, writing programs. And to be fair, not only in all arts programs where people try to standardize things. I'm doing a series with actors too, and some actors have complained about acting schools where they're, uh, you know, try, everyone has to be a method actor or something. Um, you know, when I think of, for example, uh, uh, literature of the last 25, 30 years, my wife was telling me the, the Charles Frazier novel, Cold Mountain, uh, was a perfect example of what I call this MFA formula of just describing and describing and describing with no purpose. She said, there were Civil War guns that there were four or five pages of just a description of the gun, and it served absolutely no purpose in the story or even in any kind of uh, setting of the tone. I remember Jhumpa Lahiri, the, the now Pulitzer Prize winning uh, novelist in her first sh set of short stories. The only difference that told me that this was someone of Indian background was the constant mentioning of Indian spices. And you see that along any kind of fault line, whether it's black, gay, wasp, Jew, or whatnot. You get sort of the same cookie-cutter writing, except we'll throw in a dreidel here if you're Jewish. We'll throw in a reference to some sexual act that's verboten if, if you're gay. Do you find that there is that sort of homogenization, not only in, in writing programs, but in all creative endeavors when you have an authority system like a 
that, you know, a university system that is trying to teach actors or writers or creative people that they have to be this way in order to be creative. It seems antithetical to me. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think I think what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. I, I haven't thought about it a great deal. I know I know about the argument you're making about creative writing programs and, and homogenization, and it makes a good deal of sense to me. Um, it seems to me that you do be about as, as as well off to go off into the world and have experiences and learn how to write. Like people have always learned how to write by reading a lot of great stuff and struggling and struggling and failing and failing until you uh, come close to some sort of mastery of the format. I think we can say about creative writing programs on the on the, on the positive side is it is good uh, to be inside a structured situation where you're forced uh, to read and forced to write a lot. And you get feedback from a lot of people. So you have a built-in sort of table full of uh, people giving you constructive criticism, which I think is really necessary for writers, especially young writers, uh, not just to learn how to write, but to build up the calluses, to build up the, uh, the gluttony uh, for punishment uh, that writers really need, because it is a punishing profession. Um, I also think, you know, that there's, that I, I'm a little bit bugged uh, by the, emphasis on creativity, to be honest, in creative writing programs. Um, they call it a creative writing program. And, and I've done other interviews, uh, sort of like this, to be honest, um, where I've been asked, you know, like, how do you, how, how do you people get creative? You know, where do you come up with ideas for your writing? Where do all these, uh, where do all these notions come from? As though that was the hard part. You know, as though coming up with the idea for the novel was the hard part. That's the easy part. Yeah. That comes easily to most people. Um, if you think about the plot of just about any novel you love, it's probably not all that clever. Uh, the story, it's the old stories uh, of the same old basic obsessions twisted around in, in various different ways. That's not a criticism. It's just that people are reliably all around the world attracted to the same sort of stories, the same sort of story structures, the same sort of basic primary human obsessions are worked over again and again and again and again. So coming up with the big idea isn't, isn't all that hard. What's really, really hard is having the discipline uh, to pull it off, to sit at your desk. You know, I sit at this desk uh, right here, um, usually standing um, for hours and hours every, every day, uh, practicing my, my humble, very humble uh, form of creative uh, writing. Um, and so I think that I think that's what really separates uh, the weird, real writers from people um, who kind of are one of these. You know, it's, it's, it's the ability to sit in a room like this. Like, again, look at this room. Uh, it's a basement uh, underneath my house. It's got one little window. It's a really depressing uh, place to hang out. It's kind of cheery looking right now. The light is the light is decent. I have my books. But you know, it's, I, I spend an awful lot of time in here, sort of entombed in this room. Uh, trying to write. And that's what most people lack. You know, most people lack the mic, the uh, mic. discipline, not creativity. Pull your uh, mic up, yeah. Most people, most people <laughs> lack discipline, not yeah. creativity. Yeah, I know. I've often said to people, philosophy is ideas, art is ideas in motion. Art is more the verb of how you say something, not what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, right. Well, let me, let, let's get uh, a bit more sort of anthropological. So the storytelling animal, do you delve into uh, how human beings became enamored of storytelling? I mean, obviously, our ancestors had bigger brains than, you know, marsupials, uh, than beetles, than, uh, and whatnot. So we, we, we are social animals. We're communicating things. We have the rudiments of language. Uh, but it would seem to me that the telling of stories is, is sort of a way to relax the mind. After after the tribe has gone out and they butchered the caribou or whatnot, had their fill to eat, and they've got an hour or so before they're going to doze off, maybe storytelling comes up around the campfire or whatnot. How do you think that evolved, and what purpose did it serve? Yeah, I think it's really an interesting question. You know, if you think about story, it's one of those things like, it's so primary and basic to human life that most people just never think about it very much. It's sort of like wondering, hey, why do we have hair? You know, why do we have two legs instead of three? People don't ask these questions. The same goes for why are we creatures of art? You know, why are we? Um, art's this weird uh, thing, you know, and we're kind of obsessed with it. We live in art and we uh, practice art, we consume art, uh, and we consume stories. And it's one of those things that's kind of hard to explain, kind of easy to explain here. It's kind of easy to explain when you have two legs. It's kind of hard to explain 
why we like stories so much, especially especially stories that are fake. That are stories are about the fake struggles of pretend people. So it might be obvious to you, like why you might tell a story about a real story, a true story. Hey, you know George, he walked down to the river uh, and he got eaten by a crocodile. Um, with the moral of the story being clearly, stay away from that river; it's full of crocodiles. Where if you have to go there, um, go there very carefully. Um, and so, uh, but with fake stories, with fictional stories, you know, why do why are humans so obsessed with this? You know, probably you last night and almost everyone listening to this, uh, any night of the of, of their life almost will spend several hours per night just engrossed in a novel or a short story or a film or a TV show about the fake struggles of, of pretend people. And so, so why is this? Uh, evolution should prune away wasteful activity. Uh, if unless it unless it's conducive in some way to survival and reproduction, so those people you talked about around the campfire, why did they sit around for an hour listening to stories before they dozed off? They should have just dozed off. They should have just gone to sleep and restored their energy for useful activity. And so the question is, what is the hidden sort of evolutionary benefit of storytelling that kept it from being pruned away by this ruthlessly uh, utilitarian process? And I'll, I'll just say a couple things about this. Uh, the first is we don't know, not for sure, uh, because you know behaviors like storytelling really don't fossilize very well. Um, we know sort of we have sort of what used to be called living fossils, you know, uh, tribes that used to be called primitive, but that were living in sort of something like the the basic ancestral human condition uh, up into the 20th century. And those people had richly developed storytelling traditions. So it looks like as long as humans have been humans, they've had uh, storytelling. Uh, so why, why is this? Um, we don't know for sure. Uh, this idea has only been getting attention from scholars and scientists for maybe a decade. So there are a lot of different ideas, not really enough data to choose between them. Uh, the second idea, the second thing I need to get across is that story could very well be for a lot of things. It probably is for a lot of things. And to help you to imagine this, I like to have people imagine their hands, their own hands. If you look at this thing, like, I mean, it's right in front of your face all the time. But you probably never look at it. And you, you wiggle your fingers around, you know, you see all the things that you can do. And you ask yourself this really basic biological question. What is this thing for? You know, what is it for? And you say, well, it's obvious. It's for feeding myself. And I can make this little tweezing grip. <laughs> little things and I can make this five finger chuck grip to get big things and I use it to caress people I love I use it to uh, clinch it up to, uh, to to do violence uh, when I'm threatened um, so this, the, the hand is obviously a, a Swiss army knife it's for a lot of things it's not a single purpose tool like a screwdriver or a hammer and I think the same is probably true of storytelling it was shaped by multiple <laughs> evolutionary forces to do multiple jobs now should I just launch into what my preferred idea is yeah, go ahead okay i don't want to just blab and blab no go do. um so one possibility one 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 of one of the possible uh functions of storytelling um i like to go back to the function i'm sorry the, the form of stories and to question whether or not we can jump from the form that stories reliably take all around the world to a hypothesis about the likely function so if you see a hand axe for something, like an ancestral hand axe, you, you never saw a caveman use this to chop up a goat. But you can look at it, you're like, man, this, this is probably a cutting tool. They probably got this pointy tip. You jump from the form to a hypothesis about likely function. And we all think of storytelling as this sort of really creative, artistic uh, genre. In many ways it is. But no matter where you go in the world, no matter when you go there, you always find the same amazing thing. The people who tell stories on the whole, their stories are exactly like ours. They focus on the same few big plights, big problems, and they have the same basic structure. So what's a story? A story always has a, a character. The character always has a problem, some sort of problem, some sort of challenge, some sort of trouble and they attempt to solve it. Stories are problem solution structures. And yeah, if you're an English major, you'll, you'll flog your mind right now, and you come up with a few exceptions, like, well, wow, Finnegan's Wake, does that really fit? You know, most times you find an exception, it's because the storyteller was trying very hard to break out of the prison house of this sort of universal, natural grammar of storytelling. And again, on the other hand, it might be really obvious to you that stories are this way, that they have this problem solution structure. But if you think about it, it's not one bit obvious that it ought to have been that way. 
many of us would have expected to go around the world and find storytelling traditions where the stories function basically as escape pods into these hedonistic paradises where trouble is unknown and where uh, uh, pleasure is limitless. Uh, but you never ever find that. Stories are about trouble. Stories really aren't about people having good days. So, you know, stories are about people having bad days, often the very worst days of their whole life trying to gut through. And so, um, why? Why are stories that way instead of all the other ways they could possibly be? Why are they so focused on trouble? Why do we want to go into, when we go into fiction, why do we want to go into sort of hellish landscapes uh, rather than heavenly ones? Um, and here's what I think. I think uh, stories basically function as something like uh, flight simulators. So you go into a story and you have this very rich immersion in a virtual world where you get to practice up on all the big problems of human life um, with the added benefit of a simulator that you don't die at the end. You get all the experiences, you get all the, uh, the sort of training, um, but the hero of the story dies in your place. Um, and we have some evidence that this is actually true, some sort of laboratory evidence that this is actually true. Um, showing that people who spend a lot of time in stories, especially fictional stories, uh, really do get better at, at navigating life in some very basic ways. They get better, at, they're, they're better at, their, their social skills are better, they have higher emotional intelligence, uh, they seem to be uh, better at, at, at in tasks uh, involving empathy. Um, so it seems like we, by, by entering into the sort of fictional problem-solving scenarios, we seem to get better at solving problems in the real world. And again, this is a, this is a hypothesis, so this is not uh, carved in stone. And I'm not saying this is all that stories are for, but I think it's part of what stories are for. Well, let me ask this. Uh, you would mentioned about uh, storytelling form. It seems to me that uh, uh, as human uh, technology has increased, especially in the last uh, few centuries, we've seen different types of uh, at least heroes in stories. It used to be that uh, the stories that we, we had from caveman days through, uh, I guess you would say, before the Industrial Revolution, all of the heroes were gods or kings or warriors. These were all the protagonists. In some cases, like the Gilgamesh myth, all three in one. Um, then we got modernism, uh, slowly over from, say, the 17th century with maybe Quixote uh, through... Uh, you know, the Ibsens and the, the great playwrights of the 19th and, and early 20th century, and then the modern novel coming to forth. Then we got real-life characters. We got the Willie Lomans, the Ishmaels, the Huckleberry Finn-type characters, which were sort of every man or every boy kind of characters. And now it seems that, uh, uh, from what I'm reading, in especially in American fiction, and to a certain degree, the little bit of uh, foreign fiction I'm reading too, is we're moving back towards, oh, I guess that the characters are maybe not resembling gods, but this this worship in 21st century, especially in the last 20 years with celebrity, uh, I find a lot of the characters that I read in short stories, you know, have these very vapid lives, that they're, they're much like the Kardashians or whoever the reality TV show is. Do you think that as, as, as uh, society has been speeding up, that we're moving into the different types of heroes and heroines that we're using in whatever stories. And as you said, not just fiction, but also now on cable TV and uh, uh, YouTube channels and, and web series and webisodes or whatever you want to call them, that we're, that we're, we're really just sort of uh, having a, a greater turnover rate of, of how long our, I guess, uh, kinds of storytelling heroes or, or, or characters are. Or lasting? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm actually not sure. It's, 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 a, it's a very nice overview you just did. Um, I, you know, you write a book about storytelling. It's such a vast, vast subject. You know, it encompasses so much in the human life, from fictional forms and non-fictional forms to, to the songs we listen to, to, our, to the dreams we dream at night, to the stories we tell each other over coffee or at the water cooler or whatever, uh, the gossip. Um, you know, so it's, I, I, had to, I had to draw some lines about where, what I was going to cover and what I was not going to try to cover. 
And so for the most part, I was looking for, I was looking, I was interested in the biology of storytelling, evolution of storytelling, where this comes from. And so I was very much searching for what unites all storytelling traditions rather than what separates storytelling traditions rather than whether it was across cultures or across centuries in the way that you're talking about in the west um and so i don't know if what you're saying is is, is true or not um i see you know there's a big anti-hero trend of sort of uh, satanic uh Mil- Mil- Miltonic, you know Mil- mm. milton satan uh, type uh, characters in uh, Tony Soprano and Dick Mackey from The Wire, these incredibly charismatic, uh, somewhat larger than life, uh, villainous heroes. Um, and, you know, and what you're talking about, you're, you're also talking a lot about literary fiction, um, and so, which no one reads. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, the, the audience for literary fiction is just shockingly small. Yeah. Um, and maybe you could make you could turn the argument around the other way and say well, no no what's this? this is very much an age of gods and heroes uh because what everyone wants to see is the transformers mm-hmm. what they want to see is the marvel heroes and the uh dc heroes all these some of whom are literally gods like thor and odin um they want to see uh, the supernatural uh thrillers we have uh vampires and werewolves and uh, Jane Austen among the zombies or whatever is a real sort of yeah. a rebirth of supernaturalism. So in terms of what regular people like, rather than uh, sort of elite uh, consumers of art like yourself um, and uh, people in the academy, um, I think we're seeing the same old, same old overall. Um, let me ask you, since you mentioned antiheroes, and there seems to be a kind of trend, and I think it's a bit of a cop-out. I know when I've I've spoken with some actors in my series on acting, you know, I've asked a similar question. I said, you know, know, a lot of actors say they always want to play the villain because the villain has the best lines. That's what most couple of people have said. The villain always has the best lines. But I would think, I, I think that when I'm reading, in real life, for example, it's much, much harder to be good in the face of bad bosses, uh, economic downturns, uh, road rage, all the kinds of little things. It's a much more difficult thing to, to, to try to still be a good person when it's so easy to give in to your worst instincts. Um, do you think that the rise of anti heroes is a kind of fantasy kind of thing that, oh, if only I could be like, uh, what was it, the Dexter the serial killer on uh, uh, his show, or if only I could be, you know, Tony Soprano and that asshole who, who looked at me funny in the in the restaurant, I could just send one of my goons to rub him out. Do you think that this anti-hero uh, worship, if you will, is indicative of this desire to just live in the fantastic? Yeah, it could be. I, I find it pretty. Ma- I find it find pretty fascinating. The whole anti-hero thing. Um, I find it fascinating from my own point of view. I'm sure you've had the same experience watching The Sopranos, for instance, and finding yourself, my gosh, I think I'm rooting for this man. Uh, even even as he, be- he becomes darker and darker and darker as the series goes on. Same goes for Walter White in Breaking Bad. Um, my gosh, I think I'm rooting for this man, even though he's clearly the villain uh, of the story. I, I don't know what I would attribute it to. I don't. I mean, one of the one of the things that I get into in the storytelling animal is about the dangers of having what I call a storytelling mind, a mind that is always looking for patterns of data. And if it sees disconnected patterns, like a constellation of stars, um, it wants to connect the dots and to see a sky picture that isn't really there. To see yeah, it, it is called parado- pareidolia, you know, to, to see like the face on Mars kind of thing. Exactly, exactly. Except, except instead of seeing faces, what I'm talking about is seeing stories. Yeah. And so this is where conspiracy theory, for instance, comes right. from. You know, this, this idea that uh, well, there must be more to it. There must be more to it. There must be a way to impose the order of storytelling on the chaos of our lived existences. And so it's always easy to, to, for humans uh, to, to sort of make up a story about where things come from. You know, what, what, where does this anti-hero trend come from? Is, is it, does it come from uh, dissatisfaction with the sort of cartoon heroes of the past, or does it, or does it reflect something, some sort of deep cynicism in the American character? Um, and these stories are kind of easy to tell, but I, I usually find them to be pretty uh, uh, unsatisfying. I'm not even convinced. I don't even convince myself anymore. That's partly because I sort of write the process of writing this book has attuned me 
to how careful I have to be with my own storytelling mind, with my mind's tendency to, to demand to see a story, even when maybe there's no story there to be seen. It could be just some little trend, you know, it could be, it could be this, just this random sort of data pricks uh, that, that Sopranos worked and so everybody else copied it. Yeah. You know, I did a, a show a few months ago on uh, paranormal stuff. I had a couple of fellows who were debunkers of that. And we were talking about how if you look on YouTube, you'll see all of these channels. But then you'll if you type in, say, the phrase photographs that can't be explained, and they're easily explained. You know, uh, some something is kind, kind of off or it's been obviously photoshopped. You know, it's a ghost. It's a UFO. It's a this. It's a that. Um probably the biggest 21st century trend I've seen is what's called, uh, and I don't know if you've looked into it, called uh, creepypasta. Have you seen this online? There's a there's a, a, a myth, that probably the most dominant one, is the thing called Slenderman, which started oh, about yeah. 10 yeah. years ago. A couple of years ago, two young girls stabbed one of their classmates, uh, supposedly for Slenderman. And here's, here's a story, uh, and the guy who started, I don't remember his name, but he has taken credit for it by starting it on one of these uh, online web discussion boards. And it just sort of took off. And now people have been making little videos about Slenderman, this Slenderman, that, trying to backwards work photographs and videos to pretend that this ha was known 100 years ago. Yeah. When you see that kind of sort of, I guess you would call group storytelling, because it takes hundreds or thousands of people on these web boards to, to craft out the mythos, what does that tell you about storytelling in the 21st century? Uh, if you've looked at it. Well, I, yeah, I looked a lot into conspiracy theory. This is conspiracy theory. So you've chosen Slender Man as a great example. Uh, you could have also chosen, you know, the whole 9-11 truther uh, yeah. movement where you have a massive collaborative effort by people getting together online and creating this epic, epic thriller about evil monsters conspiring uh, for their own wicked ends, and it doesn't matter if you know thousands of people have to die, and the conspiracy gets larger and larger and larger. They're writing a thriller. They're writing a novel, and it's a really good novel, actually. It's really kind of a. It would be a great sort of blockbuster novel. It doesn't really make sense. Uh, I mean, it's been debunked uh, up and down in every way it's possible to debunk something, but the sort of the, the the grip of story on the human mind is so severe, is so strong that, that these people who are deep inside this story can't get out of it. Um, so if you say, well, all the, all the, all the engineers, you know, have sort of debunked this idea that it must have been thermite that cut through the uh, girders of the World Trade Center. Uh, they've shown that, you know, it was hot enough uh, to bring down the towers. You know, and you can name all the engineers and so forth. And I said, well, those engineers must have been on, in on the conspiracy. Um, so for me, uh, this sort of thing, conspiracy theory, uh, to, uh, to some degree religion, um, which, you know, religion is, 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 is holy stories, um, holy stories and about, about characters, about fictional characters, in my view, fictional characters, uh, who are moving around in the real world, influencing our lives. Um, to me, this is evidence, uh, and the sort of ultimate evidence of the dominion, uh, the dominion that story holds over uh, the human mind. So in the case of religion, Many of us, probably most people on the planet, significantly regulate their behavior based upon on what the characters in the sacred stories uh, said they should do. And they regulate their, their behavior in crazy ways, right? They'll eat differently, they'll have sex differently, they'll decide to live or die or kill uh, differently, all because of what these stories say. Um, you mentioned character. I've always said to young people, especially again, in, in fiction uh, and, and writing, that character is plot. We don't, we're not going to really care about the Pequod if the characters weren't particularly interesting. We're not going to really care about its fate. We're not going to care uh, about Huckleberry Finn uh, if we don't get it into the character. Um, it's one thing when you're talking about gods, the Olympians, we don't really necessarily need to know every inner foible of Odin or his mistresses or whatnot. But when you're talking about the, the, the great characters, especially, let's say, in American uh, fiction, whether it's on, on uh, film like uh, Charles Foster Kane or the Huckleberry Finns, do you, what, what, to what degree do you think that storytelling is driven by the desire to get in someone else's shoes. I've often said to people that in order to have a great character, 
Forget about the color of their eyes. See what those eyes are noticing, looking at in their world, and that'll give you an idea of the character. How important do you think character is in storytelling? I think it's awfully important. You know, uh, you, you, have, you said that uh, character is plot. Is that what you said? A plot yeah. is character. Um, yeah, and I think these things are very difficult to disentwine. Uh, you could turn your formulation around uh, possibly uh, the, the other way. Um, I think it's I think it's really really important. I mean, it's a sort of uh, it's, it's the soul of it. It's the soul of it. And I do think people. Um, need to go into stories, find, find believable characters, find characters they can uh, love and, and, and hate, and they have to uh, seem like real people and act like real people. It's sort of the challenge of, the, one of the great challenges of the storyteller. And you know, so all my life I've been studying stories, but I've had this kind of question na nagging me in the back of my head. I wonder if I could do it myself. I wonder if I could uh, write a novel. Um, and because it's my favorite art form, and um, I just always wanted to know if I could do it, so now I'm trying. And I find that one of the so you have to as as a as a novelist, um, you have to create this incredibly textured, rich, believable virtual reality experience for the reader. They have to feel like they're going in to uh, a, a real world that really exists and that has texture and smell and sound. So they can recreate that whole universe inside their head, and, the, and that universe has to be populated by people who are also virtually realistic. Uh, they have to um, act like people act. They have to emote like people emote. They have to talk like people actually would talk, not how people would talk in a crappy play, but how they would actually talk uh, in real life, or some or some or some uh, simulacrum of how they would talk in real life. So yeah, so one of the one of the big challenges for me, uh, and I think probably for all writers, is is producing people that seem real to the reader. Um, I know in your book, I believe you talk about gaming and uh, the the future of storytelling. They have things called now cosplay, where people dress up in costumes and act out scenes from movies or, or whatnot. Um, do you think that uh, as people try to embed themselves? more within the story, that they're actually losing something. And I mean it in this sense. Uh, if you and I both read, pick any great novel, Huckleberry Finn or Tree Grows in Brooklyn, uh, your Huck Finn, no matter how well described by Vonnegut, is still going to be the Gottschalian uh, Finn. Mine is going to be the Schneiderian Finn. And uh, I've often said, if, no, if you didn't know who Marilyn Monroe was, and I gave a thousand... 10,000 word description of what she looked like, your Marilyn Monroe would still look a little bit different in your mind than my Marilyn Monroe. But once you put that image, and you know, the image, you know, uh, an image is worth a thousand words or whatever this uh, saying is, and, and you're in there and you're battling the Transformers in some game or, or Bugs Bunny or whoever it might be, you can't get, you can't get that. So do you think that, that even as people want to get more immersed in stories, they're actually losing something by by that. I absolutely do. Um, I think, yeah, I think we're entering, entering into something a really really interesting phase in the evolution of storytelling. So you know, you can take uh, you can tell the story of the evolution of story. So it goes back, you know, to, like to those people around the hearth fire that you talked about earlier on, and, and it was that way for tens and of, of thousands of years up until the invention of the printing press, when stories are finally written down. And even then, for a couple more hundred more years, story is primarily oral because most people can't read. It's only the printing press that makes it possible for. Mm -hmm. story to be read it makes make, makes learning to read possible because I mean uh, cheap because books are cheap enough um, and then you know you get into the, the modern age and we have uh, movies come along and uh, mass-produced novels come along and then the iPad comes along and the new thing that's going to come along is and we're already in it is immersive and virtual reality forms of storytelling. The precursors of this are, are video games where you go into a story and these are very movie-like stories and you get to move around and you're not watching the hero of the, the, the action film anymore. You are the hero of the action film. Yeah. You're the guy with the rock jaw uh, with the rock jaw and the gun and you're running around that world uh, trying to you know defeat evil. Um, Oculus Rift uh, has come along. This idea of you know you can put these, these, these goggles on and you can 
feel strong, highly immersed in a, in a very, very revealing, very, very uh, realistic uh, virtual reality environment. Um, I know that people at cell phone manufacturers are working on uh, VR big time. Um, so what's going to happen when we go into those worlds? One, one consequence, as you said, um, we won't be inventing these worlds in our head anymore. So it used to be like a novel is like a uh, script for a movie. Yeah. Uh, it's a script for the movie, and you're the director, and you right. bring it to life inside your own head. Um, this has this is just the movie. Everything's there. The whole world has been created for you. The characters have been created for you. Their faces have been created for you. So there's a lot less in the way of cognitive effort. Uh, the sort of cognitive effort that it usually takes to produce that in your mind, all that work will be done for you. The thing that really concerns me about it, and I think this is going to be the main challenge for storytellers in the virtual reality era, is this. Why do we actually like stories? What do we like about it? I think most of us like that feeling of, what, of what's been called narrative transportation. That sense we like of, of sort of falling through the pages of a novel, getting lost in that world, losing sense of our own selves, our own consciousness, the drone of traffic in the background. You're just lost in that world. Um, as soon as you start having to make decisions, though, you, you're out of the trance. You're, you're out of the dream of storytelling. And if you're in the virtual world, you have to make the decisions. You have to say, well, what do I want to look at? Do I want to look at that over here, that over there? Uh, do I want to walk down the street and go over there? Um, whereas in, you know, if you're watching Breaking Bad, for instance, uh, the director is making those choices for you. This is what you're going to look at. I'm going to frame it this way. Um, and so I think that it will be very hard for virtual reality storytellers to maintain that sort of trance-like state uh, that people really find delicious uh, when they're in, when they're engaged in, in fictional, fictional worlds. And that's why I'm a little skeptical that our, that movies, for instance, will ever be inside of a, a virtual reality environment where the um, consumer has to make the decisions about what to look at. I think that virtual reality, at least in, as I can envision it a few years out, will mainly be a gaming technology where people are uh, very comfortable making those sorts of decisions, and it doesn't interfere with that sense of getting lost and, and li sitting back and getting lost in a trance. Let me uh, just step back a little bit since we were talking about different types of storytelling. Um, uh, I'm not a big fan of Joseph Campbell, and if you want to talk about sort of the modern idea of uh, the hero and the myth, I think a lot of it came from Campbell 40 or so years ago when he first came on the scene. And one of my favorite anecdotes is when Kurt Vonnegut uh, gave one of the all-time great disses to Joseph Campbell. He said, oh, yeah, he's the guy who came up with the idea. Hero gets into trouble, hero gets out of trouble. Wonderful, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, but it's uh, – you every so often you – you sometimes see books or you see something online where they'll, they'll say there are seven types of stories or sometimes it's 12 or 13 or 17 etc and I, I i say to myself boy this 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 is at the root of the problem because we live in as far as we know even in the observable universe uh, a, an area that is to us what what the whole earth is to a grain of sand or maybe it's even smaller uh, in comparison to think of all of the ideas, all of the vast times, someone in 500 years growing up on a Saturn colony or in a thousand years, you know, in the Andromeda galaxy or something as humanity moves out and hopefully we don't get wiped out by the Borg or something like that. I mean, there's so many things that, that are out there. It just, to me, bespeaks the utter, as you said, sort of the conservative, maybe it's not conservatism, maybe it's just the limits of most people's minds. Maybe it's, it's it's a conservatism bound by nature. What do you think of, about the evolution of storytelling? Do you think that we are going to break out and as we get these new technologies self-developed or as we encounter different things? For example, we didn't know, I mean, even as we've gone out into our solar system, we, we encounter things we didn't think were possible in our own solar system in terms of the way uh, rings around planets are formed or that Pluto had ha, has a dynamic surface or, or whatnot. Uh, do you do you think that the future is going to see people say no? There's not just seven types of storytelling. Here we can do it this way, that way, the other way. Do you, uh, what are you hopeful yeah. for the future? Well, I'm very hopeful for the future. Yeah, I think we're storytelling animals. I don't think that's going to change until uh, the nature of humans does. I don't think we're more likely to 
give up stories than we are to start walking around on all fours. I think it's deeply, deeply embedded in the DNA of the species. Um, and so as uh, you know, I look forward into the future, I think we'll see new technologies of storytelling, but the basic storytelling, uh, the basic stories are going to stay the same, same basic structures, same basic human sex obsessions around sex and survival um, and uh, power, et, et cetera. Um, you, you were saying something like you can count these different plots, these different story structures in all sorts of different ways, and I think that's absolutely true. And I've always detected a, a sort of distasteful bean counter urge in people trying to tabulate exactly how many different plots there are, you know, or how many different structures they are, and different people uh, divide them up and dissect these stories in different ways, trying to get different results. And by the way, the storytelling mind run amok. Uh, this is Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell is able to, to, to fit uh, through his, using his own cleverness, his own storytelling mind, he's able to fit every hero story into this very restrictive sort of mold. It's very easy to fit just about anything into any classificatory, classificatory structure. Uh, if you're clever enough and hardworking enough, um, I think there's basically one plot myself. Um, I think you know, if you if you if you strip storytelling down to its most basic essentials, if you take everything, all the sort of uh, filigree away, all the frills away, you get down to the the, the basic skeleton that under, underlies all storytelling. This is the one thing that I see running through almost all of it is what I talked about before. This sort of universal grammar of storytelling. Stories are about characters. Characters have problems. The characters attempt to solve it. That's what a story is. Um, usually there's some sort of moral dimension to these stories, too, that's off, often important, uh, or that's, that's usually important. Unless there's some sort of moral dimension to it, the story uh, will seem empty to us. So if, you know, Moby Dick is just about this uh, deranged sperm whale that likes to smash into boats and chomp up sailors. Uh, it's not really going to be the greatest of the, the great American novels. Um, it's uh, because Melville is using all of that action to convey uh, a message about, you know, whatever it is, it's a hard message to decipher, but a message about evil, uh, most people would say. Um, that, that's what makes it stick. Um, so with, without that sort of message, it, it seems it seems empty to us. So I look at storytelling as the problem structure, that's what I call that universal grammar, problem structure within a moral context or some sort of moral thing uh, that, that storytellers are getting across. And again, I know if you're an English major, you'll be able to think of some exceptions to this, but these will be very much the exceptions to prove the rule. And by the way, you'll find that these stories are read by no one. The exceptions you'll find are read by no one, except by people who have been forced to read them by their English professors, or by people who are sort of joylessly grinding their way through through the literary can. Uh, so, so, you know, Finnegan's Wake, people don't read, uh, unless they're forced to, or they're joylessly <laughs> grinding their way uh, through the literary can. I want to I want to end this interview in the final segment that's coming up, but let me just ask a final question in this segment. Uh, in researching and writing about storytelling, uh, the narrative process, were you able to look at other creative processes such as the writing of a symphony or how maybe a dancer interprets some music or the way a painting or a painter might look at a, a canyon from one aspect or another? And were you able to have you parallax the storytelling urge with other forms of creativity? Frankly, no. No. Frankly, no. Again, I was I was having to be pretty ruthless about setting the boundaries for my project, but that is a book I want to do. Okay. Uh, on my on my to do list is a book called something like I don't know, maybe I call it the art making animal. And I'd ask those questions, or maybe I call it the science of art, something like that. That might be that might be my next uh, nonfiction book. Okay. Well, let's end this segment, and in the final segment, I'll give you a few minutes to wrap up your thoughts, and we'll do that in a moment. I have been speaking with Jonathan Gottschall. Uh, he's written a number of books on creativity. Uh, the most cogent one that we were talking about was his book called The Storytelling Animal. Uh, Jonathan, uh, if you could wrap up any final thought or uh, uh, summation uh, about creativity in general, and then just uh, state maybe what uh, your next work is going to be. Okay. Um, yeah. I don't, I, again, I've been sort of annoyed by the whole... Uh, influence, uh, this whole, whole emphasis on creativity these days, partly because I see a lot of really glib 
uh, business books. You know, how can you en- enhance your creativity in ten mm. easy steps? And you know, it's just it's, it's been somewhat of an annoyance to me uh, because I think that the it, it really misplaces emphasis, as I said before. I think that uh, creativity is pretty easy for most people, especially when it comes to uh, writing, uh, storytelling. It's not the coming up with the ideas; it's sitting around for years making that idea uh, come to life. The only thing I've noticed. Uh, and this is sort of research-based and based on my own experiences, when it comes to my own creativity, uh, I need to be somewhat disciplined, not only about working, but about not working. So there's a sort of, for me, every day starts the same way. I get up, and as soon as I can get down uh, to my office or out on the back deck, whether it's nice to do some work, I do that. I have three or four hours of intelligence in me. And as the day wears on, I get stupider and stupider. You know, uh, my I just the, the energy just runs out, um, and I need to have the discipline to stop. Then I move into sort of uh, the early phase of the day is clenched. You know, I'm working hard, I'm focused, and the, and the, and the second part of the day is unclenched, uh, where I might be doing some reading, I might be taking a walk, um, and I'm not trying to think about my project at all. And oftentimes, it's where all the good ideas come from. Uh, when when the mind is relaxed, when it's not thinking about anything, uh, that's where uh, that's when things disappear. It's like this gift. And so I walk everywhere with my little iPhone uh, attached to me, and I dictate notes um, as I as I go. Uh, I don't know if this will be interesting to your audience, but you know uh, maybe it will be since it sort of relates to what we were saying at the beginning of this interview. Uh, three or four three years ago, roughly three years ago, no longer than that, four years ago. Um, I was at the sort of end of my academic career. I wasn't really, sure, didn't really know it, um, and I was sort of. I've been working as an adjunct for ten years. I'd never found my way into the profession, um, and I was sort of pacing around my office one day, uh, kicking the carpet. You know, not feeling very good about myself. And I happened to look out the window, and this new business had opened up across the street. Uh, I never noticed it before. It was called Mark Schrader's Academy of Mixed Martial Arts. It was a cage fight in the gym. I was like, wow, that's so funny. You know, the way it's, I mean, it was so close. It's like 100 feet away. I thought it was so funny, the juxtaposition of the cage fighting gem right there across the street and with the English department uh, on my side of the road, the sort of juxtaposition of civilization and, and savagery. And I stood there at the window for a long time watching those guys. And I sort of had this little joke uh, playing in my head. It was a joke at my own expense. The joke was, what if I went across there and joined those guys? And I thought it would be funny because I'd never been in a fight before and I've never been a tough guy. Um, and I also thought it was funny because my colleagues, especially my, my boss, would be able to look up from her, you know, poetry volume. And there I'd be uh, across the street. She could see me, you know, fighting in the cage. And so I sort of laughed at that. But then I uh, I uh, went across uh, to write a book. I write a book about um, the sort of ancient glamour of violence and about masculinity uh, deep down. What, you know, why, why are men uh, the way they are? And so, uh, yeah, I wrote that book. It's called Professor in the Cage, uh, Why Men Fight and Why We Like to Watch. Um, and that was, that, was my, that was my latest project. Uh, so it's been a really big departure uh, from, my, from my previous work, obviously. Yeah, you mentioned about uh, some of these notes that people put up. I, I, the one that gets me is when people say, everyone's creative. And my wife had a great answer for that. She said... That's like saying you're an athlete because you walk down your driveway to get the mail, you know, as if that makes you LeBron James. <laughs> but anyway, I wanted to thank you uh, for spending some time talking about creativity. Uh, I will link below this video to Jonathan's website, which is uh, jonathangotchell.com, and you can look up more of his uh, information and work there. So again, Jonathan, thank you for your time. Yeah, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much for having me.